Hello and welcome to West Wind, an audio podcast about cancer, technology and medicine, and policy issues. I'm host and medical oncologist, Dr. Jack West, from the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. You can find West Wind material at beaconmedic, one word, dot com, at iTunes, or just about anywhere you get podcast content. I would just ask that you show your interest and support by subscribing, commenting, sharing by telling friends and colleagues in person and on social media, and rating it however you feel is appropriate. You can also share your ideas and opinions by emailing us at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to deviate from the interview format just for this week, this episode, and talk about an issue that I think really merits more of our concern, at least in the U.S., but probably globally. And that is the concern that I have about the bottleneck of delivering the best treatment that is being identified in the latest meetings and publications out in the broader community setting, where we have the challenge of so many oncologists seeing and treating eight or 10 or more different kinds of cancer every day, and the issue of having the progress in so many of these cancers be so fast that there's no way to keep up with that. And so we are not getting the latest and best treatments executed as broadly as we need to. And because of that, it's really limiting our ability to improve on the cancer outcomes until everyone has available the best, specifically molecular oncology tools and treatments wherever they're getting treated. Now, last year, I wrote a column for Medscape asking, how could we fail so miserably? And it was focused on a paper by Singal and colleagues in JAMA. And this was from Flatiron Health and Foundation Medicine and looked at data, both the NGS results and the paired clinical outcomes for over 3,500 patients with lung cancer coming from 275 U.S.-based practices. And all of these patients had had NGS testing through Foundation Medicine. Now, the study looked at a few different things, but buried deep in it and really not highlighted in any way was the finding that among the patients who had an EGFR mutation or an ALK rearrangement, only two-thirds of those patients ever received the appropriate targeted therapy for that driver mutation. And this wasn't just as first-line therapy. This was at any time over the course of their disease. And what I find especially dismaying about this is that these were patients who already had NGS testing. There are certainly more patients who never had the testing done and we never learned had a driver mutation that could be effectively treated with a targeted therapy. But these were patients who actually had NGS testing done, had the result that we do the test for, and yet never got the treatment for it. And when we look at a broader array of results for patients with other markers beyond EGFR and ALK, ones like ROS1 and BRAF, potentially others that have at least phase two data, MET, RET. Here we're talking about only a third of patients getting a treatment directed to that. And so clearly when we have results that could translate to better outcomes, it's not consistently leading to patients getting the opportunity to avail themselves of that therapy. Now, I have wondered what could be the challenge of getting these therapies out to people. And and I've had several suggestions, including one that the data just were not correct and that somehow patients were actually getting the treatments, but it wasn't being captured. Unfortunately, data from other sources suggests that that doesn't seem to be likely. At ASCO 2019, Gearman and colleagues presented a poster. It was abstract 1585, and it looked at just over 1,200 patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer from five Florida-based practices, 289 oncologists, and it looked at 
electronic medical records and the treatments that were administered. And this is just looking at results since the beginning of 2017, so not old data here. And unfortunately, it demonstrated that the majority of patients were not getting tested for nearly enough of the targets that have an established role in managing advanced lung cancer. Specifically, EGFR was tested in 54% of cases, but that led the pack. And then ALK was only tested in 51%. Everything else, ROS1, BRAF, RET, MET, HER2, were tested in much smaller proportions of patients. So that only 22% of the patients in this sample ended up getting tested for all four of the markers that were specified in the NCCN guidelines as appropriate targets to look for with an established targeted therapy. And only 7% of patients had testing for all seven of the markers that were specified in the NCCN guidelines that included at least phase two data that are quite encouraging and should be considered for treatment. In addition, when they looked at what happened when the targets were found, again, as in the JAMA paper from Foundation Medicine and Flatiron Health, more than half of the patients failed to receive optimal targeted therapy despite the presence of a driver mutation. And more than a third of the patients with an EGFR mutation or an ALK rearrangement ended up receiving immunotherapy before tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. This is not the optimal way to treat these patients. And in most cases, it wasn't actually from the data not being available at the time of initiating first treatment. In most cases, the reports were sent back, but presumably it was due to just enthusiasm, blind faith about immunotherapy being the optimal treatment for everybody, which isn't the case. Overall, this is really suggesting that there's a widening gap between the care patterns in the tertiary care specialty centers and in the broader community setting. And I think it's really a challenge for oncologists who are seeing and treating many different kinds of cancer every day to keep up with the new targets and new treatments that are coming out in news breaks, not just at ASCO, but every few weeks to month or so in the popular press. And it's really more than people can feasibly keep up with. But I also want to explore the question of why there is this gulf in translating NGS results into optimal treatment. And I think there are several potential reasons for that. And I'm interested in getting answers from people who might be listening about what your thoughts are, because I think that there are several potentially addressable points here. One of the issues is the long turnaround time for NGS reports, particularly when we're talking about tissue. And it routinely takes three or four weeks to get results back. I think that is something that is going to improve over time. But in reality, when patients need to start on treatment this month, It's very hard to wait on results from NGS, and I think that when there is this long interval between sending it off and thinking about molecular testing and the results coming back, it's uh, very possible for things to get lost in the shuffle. I would also say related to this, there's the challenge of the report never being seen by the oncologist. I've worked in a setting where pathologists ordered this and the results come back to pathology and then they're scanned in to EPIC in the media tab and the results are never seen by human eyes again. There may not be any alert to the oncologist that the results are available and so it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And I think that this is something that we really need to address to help make it easier for oncologists who are sending off the test to be able to get flagged about the results. And in addition, I think it's a a real problem when many of these molecular diagnostics companies send an email that requires yet another password, one of the 1,500 we need every day to get through everything, one more proprietary username and password to access results rather than making it accessible without having to hack into NORAD to get it. Another 
issue is that uh, in reality, we see that these results are incredibly complex, that these reports are often 50, 70, 80, 90 pages long. And even if you just look at the top line summarized results in the front couple of pages, they are essentially inscrutable. And it's unfortunate that when there is an actionable result, it might be buried among the 20 other non-actionable or non-target findings that are in the report, that too many of the molecular diagnostics companies are in an arms race to find not just the valuable markers, but everything you can as if volume is making up for quality. And they'll just report some combination of letters and numbers rather than highlighting that this is a target that we need to be focusing on. This is an EGFR mutation or an ALK rearrangement that has a clear therapy to go with it. Instead, oftentimes the results for EGFR mutations that are rare and do not have good data to support them, or even results like an EGFR amplification, which is not the same as an activating mutation, are highlighted in the same way as the results that we should be paying the most attention to. And so I am afraid that these reports are presenting findings in a way that make it very easy for oncologists to just miss the key result in a sea of garbage information that gets regurgitated out in these, as if you know the size of the report is the most valuable finding to justify the cost of these tests. I would also say that there is a lot of faith in immunotherapy for everyone. We see it on TV, on commercials, and both patients and physicians may be prone to this idea that immunotherapy is the best treatment for everyone all the time forever. And while immunotherapy has transformed oncology in many areas of cancer care, it is not the right tool for the job for everybody, and particularly for most of these patients with a driver mutation. It's worth noting that the efficacy of immunotherapy in patients with driver mutations is different from one driver mutation to another, but the patients with an EGFR mutation or ALK rearrangement are not well served by getting immunotherapy, at least as uh, first or probably second line therapy. And uh, these patients are overwhelmingly better served by receiving a targeted therapy instead. There are also potential issues that people have raised about drug costs, maybe deterring people from pursuing the right treatment, the targeted therapy. Also, patients may be too debilitated to receive targeted therapy, although I would say that these targeted therapies are ones that we often see profound benefits in patients who may be debilitated and may do remarkably better in a short amount of time. I would say that in the coming years, we need to address how to translate these results into the broader community. And we are just in an unstable situation that is going to become more challenging because most of us, nearly all oncologists, were not trained at the level of molecular pathology to have the expertise to manage all of these issues and know the pathways at a level that is going to be optimal for integrating the extreme complexity of molecular oncology now and in the near-term future. I think it's wonderful if centers have one or more molecular oncologists available to review these results and identify an optimal treatment approach. But the reality is this is not readily available to the rank and file community or most people in the U.S. or I would say elsewhere. I think it would be wonderful if molecular diagnostics companies that are doing these broad genomic testing could 
provide a report with a cover page that is extremely clear with identification of the one or possibly more, but usually just one, target with the appropriate targeted therapy that can't be missed. And then a listing of perhaps one or more targets that have phase two data that look promising but is not a standard of care. And then follow that with the list of additional targets that do not have strong clinical data to support using them ahead of better established standards so that oncologists and patients aren't tempted to go down a rabbit hole and pursue targeted therapies based on preclinical evidence instead of better established non-targeted therapies. I would also say that, uh, and this is based on a viewpoint that uh, Dr. Jeffrey Oxnard and I wrote with Jennifer King, a patient advocate in the lung cancer community. This was a viewpoint in JAMA Oncology in 2019 that it would be ideal to have a mutual expectation that patients receive and discuss the simplified cover page of their molecular testing so that this is never missed, so that we never have a situation of the report getting sent from the diagnostics company and it's buried in Epic and never seen again. That if we make an expectation that there should be some review of the molecular testing results between an oncologist and the patient and have a very clear cover page to illustrate what targets with a potential standard of care treatment are identified or not, I think this would be a big benefit for the field. And I would also say that having the molecular testing results simplified to a point that they can be understood by a patient is also optimal to have it be understandable to every physician because the reality is it is wrong to presume that every oncologist is going to be well-versed in the details of molecular testing and the latest mutations. I think it's really an error to presume that everyone will have that expertise. I also think in the future, it's going to be helpful, or even now it's helpful, for there to be additional sources to find information about specific mutations. Now, there are databases such as OncoKB, which is coming from Memorial Sloan Kettering. There's also Cosmic and other databases where you can look up a specific mutation and find information about how this has been treated and what targeted therapies appear to work or not work. But beyond that, I think there is very helpful to have services like molecular tumor boards that are available through an increasing number of institutions and potentially other companies to help interpret what can I do with this panel? What can I do with this report? Does this offer a new treatment or is the best answer non-targeted therapy? And it's been asked and answered, and unfortunately, there is no target. At my own center, City of Hope, we have a suite of remote consult services that is also offering interpretation and enhanced interpretation of various diagnostic tests. And I think it's going to be very valuable for people to be able to submit a molecular oncology panel result and say, what can you do with this? I think that uh, it will potentially be a new specialty or there's a value in a new specialty. When I think about molecular oncology results now, I kind of think of it as if we are getting brain MRI results and then sending the images to an oncologist with a presumption that they're going to be able to interpret the results themselves. And yeah, we can perhaps understand obvious findings with clear brain metastases, but we are not almost any of us, neuro-oncologists or neuroradiologists able to review the very refined details looking for meningeal carcinomatosis or small metastases, et cetera. 
And I would say that the detailed results of NGS findings are in that ballpark, that we need a specialty to help us with the discrete service of just interpreting what to do with molecular oncology results. I think that's something that we would be well served to have in the coming years. And I also would say that this is an area where we may well see one of the best killer app uses of artificial intelligence. If it is implemented well, this is a potentially scalable way to distill down a very complex array of molecular markers into the most valuable findings that translate to a clinical guided treatment or a lack of one. So those are my thoughts about molecular testing and translation of those results into clinical practice. I really think that uh, we need to pay more attention to ways to educate and importantly support people who don't eat, sleep, live, and breathe molecular oncology for one tumor type all day long. I think it is a real problem to have discussions and ASCO presentations focus on a level of detail that is completely inaccessible to most oncologists. And I think that until we recognize that the practice patterns cannot be replicated broadly as they are at a few centers of excellence, we are not going to be able to achieve these kind of best optimal results until we find a way to scale the implementation throughout the U.S. and many other healthcare systems. So I'd love to hear from you. I probably have said things that sound questionable, objectionable, or maybe you agree with a lot of it, but I hope you'll respond back. I'd love to have a discussion about this, but I think we need to have a lot more attention paid to not just what is happening at a few highly specialized centers in a way that is totally inaccessible to how everyone else is practicing, but be able to address how to replicate on a broad scale molecular testing and implementation of results everywhere. Thanks very much. I'm very interested in your comments. Thanks for listening. The West Wind Podcast is a Beacon Medical Interchange production with sound engineering and distribution by Mark Lindsay of Talking Speaker. We hope you'll be motivated to subscribe, whether at beaconmedic.com, through iTunes, or through another podcast service. Please also rate it, and I hope you'll be inclined to tell friends and colleagues in real life and on social media. We're always happy to get your suggestions and other input at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. Talk to you again soon.